Reader's Digest tells a great story uh, from the 1960s. And most of you are aware, if I mentioned the 1960s, you immediately connect that with the hippie generation. This story comes out of California as I look at the back of Wynn's head. Uh, she and, and Robin are some of our California uh, transplants. Is that a fair way to put that? Works for me, okay? Um, hopefully this didn't take place in, in Wynn's family, although it might have. There was a point in San Francisco's history of where there was a part of town that was becoming a very much a high rent district and so a lot of hippies moved south. They moved south 70 miles to Santa Cruz, California. And it was there that they began to settle in their families and to put their children into school. And for the school teachers especially, they could tell the influx of this generation. Because as they looked at children that were coming in the school system, they had all sorts of names that were represented. Uh, it might have been names like Time Warp, Spring Fever, Moonbeam, Earth, Love, Precious Promise. Those were names of students that actually ended up in public school. And so there was one day that there was a young man that came to school and the school had asked the parents to uh, put a name tag around the child's neck and that would allow the teachers to more easily communicate with the children. And one teacher looked at this child and his name was Fruit Stand. And so for this first day of school, you have to understand for this teacher, it was really a difficult challenge. And, and so they looked and they would say, you know, fruit stand, would you like to color this page? Or uh, fruit stand, would you like a fruit snack? And they were having these problems all there in the first day. But by the end of the day, that name seemed as natural to them as Time Warp or Rosemary. Then at the end of the day, they were getting ready to take the children out to the bus stop, bus stand. And as they made their way out to the bus stand, a teacher looked at Fruit Stand and said, Fruit Stand, do you know what bus you're supposed to ride home? And Fruit Stand didn't say anything. In fact, for most of the day, Fruit Stand had not said much. And so they began to wonder, you know, this was important. This is now not in a time that we need to worry about trying to get information. We really need to know. Thankfully, though, the school had also asked parents to put the name of the place where the student would be let off on the back of the name tag. And it was at that point that the teacher picked up the name tag, turned it around, and on the back of Fruit Stand's name tag, in plain letters was the name Anthony. Names are important. I don't know if you've done research into your name of what your first name means and what your last name means. For a long time I've known that my first name John means beloved and that's because we happen to have a man in scripture that shares that name. But I had to go and look up to find out what the name hobby means. And I'm not real thrilled to give you the answer to that right now. Because apparently from the best that I can find is that the name hobby means from the hazel tree, a hazelnut, or a nut-bearing tree. Which means anytime you ask for hazelnut coffee, I may respond. Or if you say, hey nut, I'm probably going to be right in line with you as well. We're going to do something different this morning for our time together as we open our Bibles. I want to look at just some incredible names in the Bible. And what we will find interesting is that some of the people were born with that name. Some were given that name by God. And others, their names were changed by God. But names have meaning. Names are important. There's a great application at the end. So stay with me, if you will. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. It's appropriate that we begin at the first of the Bible with the first man to walk the face of the earth. 
We back up to verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So... The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. The final phrase of Genesis chapter 2 verse 20 says, But for Adam no suitable helper was found. Most of our translations read that way are very similar to what I have just shared. However, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, the Old American Standard, the New Living Translation, or the New Revised Standard. And that's what I'd like to read to you. The New Revised Standard, Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. It says, The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not a helper as his partner. Did you notice what's missing? Where did Adam go? If we look in some translations, the word Adam is there. It's clear. In other translations, it just says, but for the man. Now, here's the thing, and this is what makes this beautiful, is that that can either be a source of controversy or it could be a clue. And in our case, it's a clue because the name Adam means man or mankind. And so it is appropriate that the first man to walk the face of the earth was given a name that literally means man or mankind. Names in the Bible typically have meaning. One of my favorites in the Old Testament is the name Isaac. Anybody remember off the top of your head what the name Isaac means? Who said laughter? All right, we have a winner in the back. Winner, winner, chicken dinner for you. Uh, Isaac means laughter. Do you remember how Isaac got that name? He got it because that was the response of Abraham and Sarah to the news that they would give birth to a son in their old age. Now, I mention Isaac intentionally because we're going to look at Isaac's father, and we're going to look at Isaac's son, both of whom had their name changed by God. First of all, to Isaac's father. When we think of Isaac's father, we typically call him Abraham. But that is not the name he was given at birth, right? Even as an adult, we know that was not the name to which he was called. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will give you. The name Abram means exalted father. The name Abram means exalted father. We know that Abram was one that followed that command of God to leave, to leave his house, to leave his father's household, to go toward this land that God would give them. One of the greatest passages in the Old Testament deals with Abram, Genesis 15, verse 6, where Scripture says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram was a man who walked by faith. His faith led him to obedience, and he walked with God. He walked along the Lord's path. He sought the Lord's will of where God would have him to go. We know that there is a significant event that takes place in Genesis chapter 17. I, I like this. Chapter 17 verse 1 begins, When Abram was 90 years old. That reminds us the Lord can do great things through people of all ages, of young and old alike. Abram was 90 years old. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And it was then that God said, I want to confirm this covenant with you. Verse 3, Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. 
your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of many or father of a multitude. That new name represented what God would do through Abraham, through the rest of his life, and even in generations to come. Even as we turn into the New Testament Gospels, what was it that the Jews claimed? What was their claim to fame? We are Abraham's children. We are Abraham's descendants. It was a badge of honor. It was also, though, quite a tribute to the man that God came to. And he said, leave your home, your father's household, and go to the land where I will direct you. Now, that's Abraham. They had a son in his old age. They named him Isaac, which means laughter. Isaac had two sons whose names were Jacob and Esau. Anybody remember what Jacob means? Jacob means heel holder. Heel holder. Again, that was a name that was representative of the manner in which Jacob and Esau were born. And see, that's, that's really significant. I think that's important. Was given the name Jacob, which means heel holder. But if we turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 32, we find out that Jacob would receive a new name. Now, this comes at an incredible time in, in the life of Jacob. Remember, Jacob and Esau had separated, and it was less than friendly terms. In chapter 32, Jacob is preparing to meet his brother again. And to say that this has uh, the, the flavor, the possibility of an intense reunion, I think that's an understatement. And so here they are, they're preparing to meet again, and we're getting this from Jacob's vantage point. Now, if you were to tell me that I had an intense meeting tomorrow, how might tonight be for me? Probably wouldn't sleep well, right? I would probably toss and turn and have a problem getting to sleep, staying to sleep, and just waiting for the morning and just looking forward to getting this over with. Because waiting is incredibly difficult. Waiting can be such a hard time. I've heard people say that they wrestled with sleep overnight on difficult nights like that. Jacob, though, didn't wrestle with a good night's sleep. Jacob wrestled with God. And an incredible thing happens as they wrestle through that night. Jacob showed himself to have quite this intensity. He would not give up. He would not give in. Even to the point that it said in verse 26, the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said to him, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Significant passage there. You're no longer going to be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. Israel, a name that points to a struggle with God, that points to God prevailing, that points to overcomer. And again, think about the significance of that name for the individual Israel and for the nation Israel throughout the remainder of the Old Testament. Now, as we look elsewhere in the Old Testament, just a brief note, then we'll turn to the New but as we look through the remainder of the Old Testament, it's important to note that there were times that names were changed, but God didn't have anything to do with that. If you go back and you read the story of Ruth, you will find that Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, wanted to change her name. She wanted to change her name to Mara. This is interesting because Naomi means beautiful. Mara means bitter. And if you remember the events that had taken place in Naomi's life, she went from this point of beauty to a point of absolute bitterness. 
Life had just dealt her a horrible blow. And she was bitter and she wanted to remain bitter for the rest of her life. Here's what is interesting. History did not allow that to happen and neither did Ruth. They would not call her by the name she desired. Also another name change of significant interest is the name Daniel. If you look at the time of the exile, Daniel is taken captive and he's brought in uh, to, to the household there and he's a leader among leaders. And, but if you notice when he was brought into exile, they wanted to give them new names and his name was to be called Belshazzar. But scripture never follows that name change. Because the one thing that was important for Daniel was to remain faithful to God even to the point of the diet that he kept, his prayer life, and the name that he had. He never wanted to lose his identity as a follower of God, even to the point of his name. Important lessons for us. Now let's turn to the New Testament. John chapter 1, verse 42. John chapter 1, verse 42, Jesus is gathering this first group of disciples. These are men that would follow Jesus for several years ahead. In verse 42, we know that Jesus had come to Andrew, and Andrew, the first thing he did was to go get Peter. Uh, chapter 1, verse 42, and Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. At this, uh, he looked at him, Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon son of John. You will be called Cephas when translated is Peter. Now this takes place early in John's gospel. But if we turn back to Matthew chapter 16, we know that this is an announcement that is made in Matthew's gospel that is part of a significant conversation. Jesus has asked the disciples, what about others? Who do other people say that I am? And so they answered that question, but Jesus followed that up by saying, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, Matthew 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The name Simon, and then we have the names Cephas and Peter, which really fit side by side. The name Simon means literally to hear. And so at the beginning, he was known by a name that meant to hear. I find that almost humorous because not only did Peter apparently hear, but he also was one to speak quickly, and I don't know whether that fit into his name or not. But we know that Simon meant to hear. But when his name is changed to Cephas, which translated means Peter, what did that word mean? rock or stone because Peter was going to be a foundation in the early church. Peter's statement to Jesus was a foundational statement in the early church. The gospel message is centered around the idea that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so again, the name given by Jesus, the new name given to Simon is one that points to the role that Peter would play in the early church. A significant name change. And then finally we have one more name, one final name. For that we turn to Acts chapter 13 verse 9. Derek read for us this morning the part of the story where Saul has come to know Jesus. Remember, Saul was one that he, he was an evil man. He was a mean man. He thought that he was being passionate. He thought he was being sincere. He thought he was following God. But it was his point to destroy the way. It was his point to destroy the early church. 
And so he was doing everything that he could. And it got to the point where Scripture says he was breathing out murderous threats against the early church. But on that road to Damascus, Saul met the Lord. And when he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus Christ. I'm the one you're persecuting. Why? And it's great when Ananias finds out, because he becomes a key player in the story as well, of sharing part of the gospel message with Saul. If you'll remember in that vision, Ananias finds out that Saul is going to be a chosen instrument for the Lord's work in the early church. And as George mentioned this morning in his communion thoughts, Saul slash Paul played an incredible role in planning churches, in sharing the gospel, and in writing letters that have remained preserved and are part of our scripture that helps us as we follow the path of Christ every day of our lives. I want us to focus on this passage, Acts chapter 13, verse 9, because it's in this passage that we become aware of the name change. Scripture just simply says, and this is just part of the verse, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the only part of the passage that gains our attention today. Because we, what we find out is this man who was called Saul, which by the way means desired. Saul means desired, but Paul, what would Paul mean? The word Paul means little. Isn't that significant? Here's why I think that's significant, because I listen to things that Paul said about himself. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Saul means desire, but Paul means little. To me, that speaks of the humility of this man who was such an incredible leader in the early church. Church names are significant. Perhaps you've heard the story of Alexander the Great powerful leader, and there was a point where he had conquered all of the known world, and it is even said that at a point that when he realized there was no more land to conquer, that he actually wept. He was a courageous man. He was a strong leader. He would get on horseback, and he would go out into the field of battle with his troops, and he was the man that he was judge and jury on that field of battle. If there was a problem with any of his troops, that those people were brought to him, and the stories were shared with him, and he was the one that provided the answer, resolved the conflict. He was judge and jury. And so there was a young man that was brought to him one day, and he had the man brought to him. There's a circle of people around them. And Alexander the Great looked at this young man and said, Young man, what is your name? And the officer that was with him said, Sir, his name is Alexander. And it said at that point that Alexander the Great's face somewhat softened. And that just really kind of relieved the pressure of everyone around and so then he followed up by asking the question, what is the charge against this young man? Well, sir, he deserted. We were in the field of battle, and we were about to engage in battle, engage in war, and, and he ran away. And it is said that Alexander the Great's face changed countenance again that what had softened now became very tough again. And he looked at that young man and he said, Young man, what is your name? 
By this point, the young boy is just shaking like a leaf, and he said, um, My name is Alexander. And this time, Alexander the Great's voice rose again. He said, Young man, I said, What is your name? Um, my, my name is Alexander, sir. And Alexander the Great looked this young man in the eye and said, Then, young man, you either change your attitude or change your name. Change your attitude or change your name. I tell you that story for one more passage of Scripture. If you will, look in your Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. If these examples today don't tell us anything else, I hope that we leave today with this understanding that there is much to be said about a name. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. I'd like to read this out of the New Living Translation. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. For those of us that have named Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we wear the name of Christ. The word Christian literally means belonging to Christ. And so church, I share with us this truth this morning. All of us today, whether our name be Glenn, George, Debbie, uh, Sandra, whether it be Angela or Alec, or whether it be Alice, or whether it be Jessica, whatever our name be today, for those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there is one name that we share in common. We all wear the name of Christ. We are Christians. But church, I have to tell you, there is a burden, there is an opportunity, there is a responsibility that comes with that name. And we need to understand, if we're not living according to God's plan, God's message for us today would be clear, that we either change our attitude, we change our path, or we change our name. And so it's our prayer today that we would wear the name of Christ. And that if you've never done that, if you've never experienced the forgiveness, the healing, and the wholeness that comes from being a follower of Jesus Christ, put on the name of Jesus in baptism today. For those of us that do wear that name, may we wear it proudly, may we wear it boldly, and may we wear it faithfully.